Uh, invitation, sir. Um, I should be on that list. Name? Stanley. Yeah, uh, nice try, buddy. No, nice no, try. really, I, nice I'm try. Stanley. Yeah. Hello and welcome to episode 113 of the Lazy Couch Podcast. We're here to give you all you need to know about consumer tech, the internet, and all things origami. My name is Jeff Kim, and Pika Pika! My name is Kelvin Lee, and gold is not pink. <laughs> what was that? Gold is not pink. Oh. Oh! <laughs> what is gold? If it's not pink, what is it? I don't know. I've been spending the last week trying to convince people that my MacBook Air is gold and not pink. It's kind of like a rosy, bronzy. It's chrome. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's, it's actually is kind of pink the more I look at it. Uh-oh, in certain types of light. <laughs> yeah, mm. mostly, you know, in, in my room staring back at me. So hang on, like um, on, fr- on the outside, it's definitely maybe pink, but from your vantage point, is it also pink? <laughs> Well, I think in the dark, it's not pink. <laughs> no. It's like the no, it's pink so episode bad. all over again. It's not so bad. It's not mm. so bad. It's not so bad. Um, yeah, so uh, this week, um, we've got no real big tech event, but uh, we've got a couple of uh, big sort of tech news pieces that we're going to go through. I'm going to say they're pseudo tech events. Yeah, very mm. meta events. Um, mm. But before we begin, Kelvin, uh, just just want to touch on Stan Lee because we had a little yes. bit of a opening there. So ninety five, pretty good. Ninety five, pretty good innings. Yeah, so, no, definitely, man. Um, well loved by everyone, I believe, except for Bill Maher. <laughs> did, did you hear what he said no. uh, yesterday? No, he said something like, uh, "You know, Bill Maher, the yeah. you know half comedian guy." Um, and uh, he said, you know, he's the reason why a lot of Americans are dumb or something like that. What? Yeah. There's a lot of reasons why some Americans are dumb. That's definitely not down to one man. Mm-mm-mm. Anyway, Stan Lee um, passed away, unfortunately. Um, you know, he's been a hero for a lot of people. I guess I didn't really get into comics until I was older. But like, you know, a lot of... Uh, directors producers creators uh, all types of people um you know that they, they literally grew up on his stuff you know his characters like spider-man and the x-men and iron man basically all the avengers and the fantastic four who else yeah am i missing anyone no i mean there's a lot daredevil everyone punisher um i i grew up on x-men mm. um so you know i owe him a lot um, but also, I think one of the one of my favorite parts about Stan Lee is how he made it into the mainstream. Everyone knows who Stan Lee is. If you ask anyone on the street, um, you know, name me one comic book writer slash you know uh, producer, and everyone says Stan Lee. They can't name anyone else. So you know, mm, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I guess he wasn't really the uh, you know he didn't draw anything, not not to my knowledge. But he was the he came up with the ideas, and you know, back in the 50s 60s i don't know when, when he started exactly maybe 60s um you know some some of these uh, characters are pretty out there i guess and good on him yeah and, and one of the most special things about stanley is how he made the characters more relatable uh in mm-hmm. its time so you know that's why you get spider-man who is a real geeky kid um because you know we can relate to him if you're stuck in high school and nobody likes you i mean who doesn't want to have superhero powers mm-hmm. so stan lee actually made superheroes way more relatable and you know he you could argue that you know he started the golden age of comic books which brought you know us to where we're at now with marvel and uh being such a powerhouse that's right yeah so Vale Stanley, Stanley Martin Lieber, mm. his uh, birth name, apparently. Um, yeah. So on that, I, I guess, you know, we've got a, a good wave of Marvel movies coming up over the next few months, mm. which is pretty interesting. And, and I, I do believe he's already done the cameo for all those movies. So, wow. Um, yeah. Because those movies have already, already been filmed. So uh, what, what's next one? Captain Marvel. And the big one, the Avengers. Yep. All right. And you know what? I mean, nothing you can't CGI into these days. Yeah. I mean, I don't want them to do it forever. Like, you know, <laughs> in the year 2025, Stanley's still going to make an appearance. Oh, I really hope not. Um, okay. So today's episode is about what exactly? We're not quite sure. <laughs> I don't know where to start, actually. 
Um, well, let's, let's see what we have on the list. So we've got the Samsung Developers Conference. We've got mm-hmm. the Web Summit in Lisbon. We've got news that, you know, um, there's there's a new chairwoman at Tesla. And we're going to talk about Singles Day. Ooh. So it really is just a roll of the dice. Sure. Uh, I guess we start with Samsung then? Yeah, why not? All right. Um, I'm going to kick it off with a bit of a funny one. Um, okay, Marquez. Um, I think, you know, this has sort of been on everyone's sort of mind the last couple of weeks. So here we go. Guys, guys, it's happening. We're finally getting, we're finally getting folding smartphones. But like, but why though? (laughs) That's it. (laughs) But why though? I think that's probably the the three most uh, fitting words to describe the Galaxy Foldable. Um, I, I, I don't know if, if, if I had to think of something in terms, if I had to think of an answer right now, there's mm-hmm. a couple of factors to it. One, no one's done anything interesting with phones. So everyone's trying something crazy. Hell, make it foldable. Um, and the second one is because there is no real viable Android tablet, Samsung is going to put it in your phone. Put, put a tablet in your phone. Okay. Quite literally. Yeah, that's right. Now, I mean, I think on the surface, Kelvin, I think uh, you, you can laugh about this. Uh, it's it's mm. very gimmicky, typical Samsung. But, you know, more and more I think about it, I think it might have legs. I, you know, no, no, ca- I, I agree. Oh, do you? Okay. So they're, they're actually calling it the Infinity Flex display. Um, and I have Justin Dennison, and he is the Senior Vice President of Product Marketing at Samsung. Um, I guess you can sort of see him as the the Phil Schiller of Samsung, and he's been um, he's, he's been in- introducing a lot of the new phones lately. Um, this is how he introduced the foldable phone. And I'm sure you're all wondering what it looks like in real life and how it works. Well, want to know more? Ooh. It's finally here. When it's open, finally, it's a tablet offering a big screen experience. Thank you. It's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. When closed, mm. it's a phone that fits neatly inside your pocket. Whoa. Well, Thank you. Fit is a bit of a stretch. Oh, sorry, I was just clapping. Um, I know, I. <laughs> so did you, did you see this part because uh, they, they turned the lights off? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was very dark. Let's let's be honest here. Yeah, um, so you saw a screen, and then you saw another screen, which is a bit bigger. I think that's about all we saw. Um, yeah, from from what I can tell, it's a much better looking tablet than it is a phone because when it's folded in half, that thing is not small. Uh, oh, you mean uh, the the height of it or the thickness? Yes, the thickness. Yes, that's right. Um, no, so I can't really see. You're going to have to have pretty big, uh, deep pockets. Oh, big and deep pockets because uh, it's touted to be uh, over $1,700 US. Well, the first of anything is usually like, you know, crazy expensive, right? Yeah. Until they can get into the, the you know, bigger production volume. Yeah. So, I mean, if we break it down, I mean, the concept wise, you know, I think because a lot of the other um, sort of concepts that have come over the years with the foldable phone, because it's been rumored for, I guess, the last four or five years almost. Uh, and in fact, there, there was a company that um, trumped Samsung a couple of days before this event. Did you hear about this one? I'm just not remembering the name of them, but like it was this really awful, just imagine like a wallet type material and it's got like plastic screens yeah. around the outside. So in, in Samsung's uh, case, it's, yeah. It was, it's Chinese. It's Chinese, yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was like Chinese the Royal. The Royal Corporation. Oh, the honor. Is it? I don't know. It's one of those ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it had a pretty pretty shitty name. Um, now they they sort of folded the you know the outside right. So the screen was the outside like a wallet, and the the screen was outside the wallet. If you can think about that way. Um, in Samsung's case, so when it's folded, it, you obviously you see it on uh, the screen on one side, but mm. the tablet screen is is on the inside. So I think. That's right. You know, I think that, you know, obviously they have thought about it, <laughs> how the user interface would work. 
Um, yeah, look, um, you know, if, if they do manage to get something out by next year, I think they'll be pretty good. There's already rumours that LG is going to announce something at CES very early next year. So, look, I, I think everyone's going to sort of flood the market with this type of thing. Um, and it could be just the, the whole, you know, uh, no bezel thing that Samsung kind of drove in the first place. Yeah, I, I, I think what I really like is, um, so when it's folded, the f- at your, your, the normal phone screen on mm. the outside doesn't look great. But I think, I think there's a point to that because uh, think about how we use phones, right? If we are checking messages or taking phone calls, we don't need a large screen. Um, but if you want to view videos or web pages, you just open the phone up because the tablet. So I don't need the outside screen to be spectacular right i just need it for notifications mm-hmm. whatsapp messages um and, and a couple of like maybe a calculator or a calendar check or a weather check but when i really want to sort of consume media or do anything more immersive then Play i can Fortnite. open it up so yeah oh well yeah like Fortnite. Mm-hmm. um so it kind of makes sense that the outside screen is not as great and i don't mind that and it saves battery power i guess yeah, I mean, we've we've seen devices with, uh, what do you call it, the e-ink technology on the outside, right? Mm. Or on the other side of the phone because um, they're not foldable. Um, now, um, apparently Google had some news at the same time as well. And um, here's Mark Kez again just explaining a little bit of that. There is a reason it went dark in there. This is very unfinished. Samsung said the actual phone is coming hopefully next year in 2019. And even when it does, if it does, it's first generation stuff. So I wouldn't expect anything too radically polished. Uh, Around the same time, we also did get Google announcing Android is going to support folding displays natively. So that should help smooth some things over, especially in the graphics department. But what we were looking at on stage was not some finalized, completed folding phone that you can buy sometime soon. It was a a working prototype of a flexible device that can hopefully be turned into something they can manufacture by sometime next year. Yeah, so they'd use there's um, you know, Android supporting that natively, that experience, folding experience going from I don't know, like a square size screen to something rectangular. <laughs> um, rumor is it's going to be called the Galaxy X or the Galaxy F. Um, I hope they go with X. But then also it clashes with the new Galaxy S10 coming soon. So good luck, Samsung. Oh, okay. So X is in not 10, but just X. That's right. Yeah. Um, I think so, F would be better. Yeah, F would definitely be better. Because that's what people are calling it already. So the Galaxy F. So you don't mm, think uh, <laughs> you, you don't think it'll be part of the S series? No, I think it'll be sort of like a, there'll be the Note. The yeah. S and the F, I think, which makes more sense. <laughs> yeah, or does that, it? Yeah, well, I mean, you could kind of imagine, you know, that they might start it off as a separate line and then, uh, you know, inverted commas, fold it into the S series because that's what they did with the S. Hey, you said fold. That's, yes, that's why it was in inverted commas, Calvin. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I don't know. There's, there's not much to, you know, add to that, I, I, I guess, until something actually comes out. Um, they were very scared to show it off, but I think they probably felt the need to say something about it or show something. Um, you know, that, that a lot of power hitters, you know, talking about this, they had DJ Ko, um, they had another guy in a wheelchair, <laughs> um, shouldn't make fun of those people, but like he he's um, he's one of the top engineers at Samsung, very smart. Um, unfortunately, his name is Yu Suk Chung. The so people call him E.S. Yes uh, Chung. Wait. Yeah. He's in a wheelchair and his name is Yusak. Yeah. Oh, poor fellow. Yeah, poor guy. But he's apparently really smart. He's he's yeah. sort of the brains behind the whole thing. Um, you know, engineering wise, I mean that's mm. pretty pretty cool if they can pull it off, right? So yeah. Yeah, I mean the other technical challenge is the battery life. If I were to run this phone um in, in, in tablet mode most of the day, what happens to my battery life? Because the, the amount of pixels it has to push in a screen that size, mm-hmm. it's going to be pretty intensive. So yeah, I, I, you know, Hey, kudos to Samsung for trying something a bit crazy. You know, Apple used to be that company and now, now it looks like, you know, Samsung is the one to look to when you want something crazy. Mm, I don't know if I totally agree with that comment, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th- I think the difference between Samsung and Apple is like, you know, that maybe they do both, or at least used to do crazy stuff, but you know Apple does it in a more measured way, where you know they'll do it when 
something's ready, whereas Samsung will just like throw everything against the wall and see what sticks sort of thing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, both both uh, methods are, you know, okay, I think, you know. Um, Apple has, you know, created a, a phone category and Samsung have sort of driven the, the form factor of that. So, you know, good on both of them. Um, the other big news from the conference, um, apart from the One UI, which um, which is kind of kind of lame, I think it's you know they, they've got a. No, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, it, yeah. It, for me, it was you know Android Pie was coming. Um, you know, then uh, Samsung announced a, a new UI on top of that. Yeah. Um, but it's it's a clean up, and you know what? I think any the closer you get to stock mm. Android is is always a plus for me. So. From all the videos and screenshots I've seen so far, it looks a bit rounder, mm-hmm. uh, but also it looks a lot cleaner, and it's, it's meant to sort of work a lot faster. So you know, it's all good things, but boring things. Yeah, and of course, you know, there, there's going to be some issues with the actual implementation of that design because I think they have good ideas, but execution-wise, they kind of fail. I think mm. um, just because they don't control the the end-to-end, you know, hardware and software. Um, the interesting thing for me though was Bixby 2.0. Um, so did you know, Kelvin, that, um, Samsung a couple of years ago bought the company Viv, V I V. Um, no, you don't know anything about that? No. Okay. So Viv, Viv is by a guy called Dag Kitlaus. Um, he's, he's not really a dark oh maybe he is but uh he's a norwegian guy that actually started siri and then after he sold that business to steve jobs um he created viv so wow yeah. so 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 bigsby and siri have the same father exactly yes dun, dun, dun. Dun, okay dun, dun. now um you know samsung is not just about phones um they have a whole ecosystem of a lot of household products and devices. Um, so we always, I think we both felt that Samsung has sort of been in that leading position in terms of IoT. Mm. Um, but what, what's what's been the problem with IoT? Um, it's like there's there's no real good connective tissue, right? There's there's no common language or you know from one one machine talking to another machine, you know, exchanging some sort of data to to help the user that sort of thing. Um, now Bixby, this is where Bixby 2.0 is coming in. And, um, I've got a clip here, which is a bit of a, uh, marketing, marketing thing from them, but, um, I thought it was quite cool. So here it is. You will be able to teach Bixby what it needs to know about your API, your service and your content so that Bixby will be able to send requests to your API when users interact with Bixby. What's going to be created out of this is going to be deeper, more intimate relationships with customers, um, and that's going to make your your business grow. We're going from a phase where every other assistant does a few dozen things, but we're going to open up this ecosystem that allows it to do thousands of things, and what those things are are going to be completely new. All right, so you know, listening to that back again, it, it is it does sound a bit fluffy, but um, I think you know th- what I'm sort of getting from this is that, uh, that there's a new strategy for Bixby, definitely, which is opening it up to developers. Um, you heard a lot of mentions of APIs there, and um, the last person that's speaking there was Dag Kitlaus himself. Um, now I do want to delve into this maybe in a future episode um, because I, I need to. Um, not uh, watch not just the keynote, but um, he did a one hour thing there, and and I, I didn't get a chance to look at that. But I think there's going to be some good stuff in there. Um, yeah. So, like, w- what's your experience with Bixby so far? Like, have you you you've never owned a Samsung product, have you? No. Okay. no. Um, well, it's been a while since the Note Three, but yeah. I this week I did pick up a uh, Amazon Echo Dot. Okay. Um, I, I signed up to Audible and they gave me one for free, mm-hmm. which I think everyone should go sign up for. Uh, sure. And then you can cancel it after. But what I what I realized after having used Alexa for about a week or so is the good thing about the Google Assistant and Alexa is they sort of partner 
up with other providers to provide a complete IoT um, experience. You mm-hmm. know, I'm sure it's flawed a little bit, but you know, they're inclusive. The problem with I, I, I'm concerned about Apple and Samsung is it will only work with some of their devices or their very selective partners, mm-hmm. and because of that, you know, you, your, your your fridge and your washing machine and your microwave and your TV will all have to be Samsung, just like all your Apple, Apple devices have to be Apple in order for them to work together. And I think that's not the kind of, you know, uh, world I want to live in. I, I just want everything mm. to be, you know, be able to work together on some sort of open source mesh type thing. Um, so that's my only concern when I hear about, you know, Samsung trying to build some sort of language that only their devices can talk to sure so i think i i think well i I think i need to look into this a little bit further but i think that was the old world the new world is they're going to open it all up um Mm. so bixby um yeah we'll, we'll we'll talk to other types of devices so this is what i'm thinking um so say you're a bank um and you've got devs right and um Maybe there's a way to like get your um, you know have some sort of automated uh, I don't know recipe for you know when you run run out of something in the fridge then use um, Bixby to order something through Amazon but also pay through your you know bank account or something like that so maybe that's not the best example but um, yeah I think this is the thing I need to look into further like more sort of real life examples but I believe this is the direction direction that they're heading towards. Um, now, if you think about like the other instance, um, I call the, you know, the Google and the Alexa, the God bots. So they're very, um, you know, they have a wide variety of skills, but they're still quite, uh, fixed in terms of, you know, the Google assistant will, you know, you can't really uh, develop on top of that any further because Google don't let you, um, Alexa is kind of the same. I think that they do have partnerships with um, certain certain companies for for different skills, um, and then you've got the dumb bots like Siri and Cortana, where everything all all the processing happens like on the device, right? Maybe not so much Cortana, mm. um, but Bixby. I think it's just sort of it's, it's a combination of both of those things, um, and you're going to have like developers sort of. Well, I think that this is what they're hoping to do, um, just just create on top of that layer, or it's a middle layer between everything. All right, with Samsung all done up, I thought we take a bit of a a tight left turn into Web Summit 2018. Um, this is um, my first sort of uh, look into Web Summit. Have you heard of Web Summit before? I think I have. I didn't realize it was at, in Lisbon every single year, like for the last, I don't know, 10 years or something, right? Yeah. Um, before we get into what Web Summit is, and I know this is going to be a bit weird, but I'm going to play some um, a, a clip from the closing of Web Summit just to sh- show our listeners how big this thing actually is. So um, let's kick it off. Um, I've got it right here. And let me recall the three challenges of last year. The first challenge was to keep Web Summit in Lisbon. We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it it. thanks to Perry. Thanks to Faye. Where is Faye? She must be somewhere. Thanks to the mayor of Lisbon. Thanks to to the Portuguese government. And thanks to all of you. All of you. Thank you very much for being here. Second challenge. The second challenge was the one of keep moving on the digital revolution. You did it. You did it. With your startups, with your alphas, you did it. Thank you very much. And the third challenge, you recall Al Gore was here, was to make more people aware that climate change was not fiction. What? It was not fake news. <gasps> it was fake real. Fake news. What's that got to do with the web? <laughs> see, see, that's 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 which is why I think that gives you a good flavor in terms of what Web Summit is. And who was that? Kelvin? <laughs> that's a good uh, do we know who that was? That's a prisoner of Portugal, my good friend Marcelo Rebelo de Souza. Uh, um, Portugal like, president. Which other digital conference do you get the president of a country attending? Now, who are Web Summit? Mm. So I'm looking at the website right now, which has crashed, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> Good old Web Summit's website crashed. Um, last year, like you, as you heard, they had Al Gore. Um, this year, they also had people like you know Ev Williams, the founder of uh, Medium. Oh, yeah. yeah. They also had you know like the European European Commissioner for Competition. They had your good friend Young Sun, the President and Chief Strategy Officer of Samsung. They had Lisa Jackson, Jackson, Vice President of Apple, Tim Bernays Lee, um, other interesting people. Um, the uh, Chief Studio Head for Minecraft. Um, CEO of Shell, so on and so forth. Like it gets huge, right? Mm, mm. Um, oh, and also Palmer Lucky was there. Hey. So a lot of big wigs talking about the future of the web. Um, and like you said, this is the tenth, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, web summit. Um, so they they talk about everything from Web three point to crypto uh, to blockchain. Um, there's over nine hours. <laughs> of youtube videos you can watch um and it's it's very technical and it's quite heavy uh there is one little section that really stood out for me and that was robotics i um, not sure whether you saw this but there's a company called hansen robotics run by oh a- i knew they were the robots hansen the band no yeah yeah they, you know they, they kind of work um their their chief scientist is trust me once you look at the guy you know he's a scientist his name is ben goetzel um and they brought two robots on stage that were pretty creepy Mm -hmm. um i'm gonna let them tell you more about it i'm i'm here as the chief scientist of hansen robotics i've led the software team creating the brains of these amazing robots And also, I'm here as the CEO of SingularityNet, the blockchain-based AI platform which uh, we're building and which is helping to supply these robots with some of their intelligence. So, Um, I had to cut the hell out of that um, that intro up by Ben because he he was holding a piece of paper, scrunching it all up. He Mm -hmm. had uh, he was moving all over the stage. He had certain sort of uh, twitches and stuff. So he, he had a lot of ums, a lot of ahs. So not a very polished speaker, uh, but, but you can tell he's poured his heart and his soul into these robots. Um, I've got a bit of a clip uh, uh, of the robots speaking. Um, they're not very polished, but they, they do have personality. So bear with me just to give you a rough idea in terms of what these robots are capable of. Sophia. Here, here we are again. What do you think? It's good to be back. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna tell the audience a bit about some of your upgrades, mostly to your mind. I know you might have seen on videos. Sophia has walking legs, but we're not gonna show them today. But we're gonna show some of the upgrades to her her thought processes and some of Han yeah. as well. She left her new legs in Las Vegas. So, uh, <laughs> so it's two robots. There's Hans and there's Sophia. And throughout this 24-minute YouTube video, they're just conversing with each other, which I think is what is amazing about these robots. Now, obviously, I can't tell if it was pre-recorded or or, or these were two robots actually talking to each other. So you heard her say, you know what, uh, you know, uh, I, I actually have legs, but I, I don't have them with me right now. And Hans goes, yeah, that's because she left them in Vegas. Right. Um, so all this is happening on the fly. The AI lives on some sort of blockchain technology called Singularity.net. Yep, it's like um, three buzzwords in one. I, lo- I love that. Yeah, I know. But that was, that was, that was, that was, you know, uh, the difficult thing about Web Summit is everything is of of is of that level, mm. um, and anything that wasn't was you know people like Al Gore and the president of Portugal talking about very high level, sort of you know climatey changey type topics. So it was either way too technical or way too basic. It was hard to find a middle ground for everyone else to to, to sort of mm-hmm. you know be able to get their minds around. Right. Sounds sounds like uh, the kind of audience would be like C level executives of maybe mid sized companies. You know, they'll, they'll go to Lisbon, have a great party, and come back with lots of buzzwords. 
Yeah. Yeah. Now, now that the web summit, the website is back again, um, these guys don't just do um, the web summit in Lisbon. They also do Collision in Toronto, Rise in Hong Kong, and Money Conference in Dublin. So they seem to be one of the bigger sort of event management companies around doing a lot of these big events, attracting a lot of big talent. Mm-hmm. So, so for me, it looks like a, a funding investment type conference where they're trying to get tech companies and banks, everyone in the same room to invest in all these different projects. Hence why there were so many demos of robots and capability and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so definitely not one for, you know, your, your average Joe um, to, to go to, it sounds like, you know, what you do get is a bit of a precursor into the future, but it also seems a little bit fluffy. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it was the first time I've uh, heard of it. Um, it was happening just as I was uh, looking into what we can talk about this episode. Um, I, I think if if I do get more of a chance, I might sort of delve into some of the talks because like those names that you mentioned, like Tim Berners-Lee, especially who is, uh, you know, he, he created the modern web well, the web, actually, mm. the World Wide Web, that is, wrote the first bits of HTML. Um, yeah, because I, I know he's uh, just about to start a new project um, regarding your personal information, um, which is something else I want to talk about in a future episode. So, yeah, I might, I might um, if I get a chance, I might sort of look into some of those. Um, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> apart from robots, actually, speaking of robots, I, I do have a somewhat related clip. Can I play yeah. that? It wasn't from the of conference, but uh, okay. No, no, no. So this was on the news, and I think just about every news channel covered it. Um, but, you know, we or us at the Lazy Couch podcast, we know this is a bit of a sham, but here we go. Hello, everyone. I'm an English artificial intelligence anchor. This is my very first day in Xinhua's agency. My voice and appearance are modeled on Zhang Zhao, a real anchor with Xinhua. I will work tirelessly to keep you informed as texts will be typed into my system uninterrupted. Right, so apparently this is the world's first AI anchor, news anchor. You mean the world's first screen reader on a TV? Yes, <laughs> with a bit of animation. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do they keep doing these things? Uh, I mean, like, and, and this is how it was reported. It's like world's first AI robot, uh, anchor. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's an easy way to get into the news, right? By calling a video with sound mm. an AI mm. thing. Mm. Um, yeah, but hell, you know what? Um, Could not even worth talking about. Yeah, you know what? Makes me really sad. I, what I, does I, make you really sad, Joe? Well, I don't know if I... Yeah, okay. So I, I've been like using LinkedIn a lot more. I won't yeah. get into any reasons why I would or... Yeah, whatever. But <laughs> on the feed, like these these videos will come up about, oh my God, uh, this is so creepy. And like these were the comments for that video. It's like, it's, it's just the screen reader. <laughs> it's just like really, really yeah, like- a bit of English. Um, anyway... Um, that that made me really sad this week. Yeah, I, I feel like we can almost do an entire episode on LinkedIn because I have also been spending a lot of time on LinkedIn. Um, I, I think I've got to a stage where my LinkedIn feed is very, very clean. Um, I've unfollowed a lot of people because they keep, you know, sharing these oh. videos or inspirational quotes and things like that. Can you can you unfollow them without disconnecting or do you have to like disconnect? Yes, you can. No, you can Ooh. unfollow them without um, unconnecting them or however you oh, want to call okay. it. Um so my feed is quite clean now. And the other reason why I really like LinkedIn is whenever we share anything about the show or whenever I put up posts, the engagement is through the roof compared to Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, so hence why I'm, I, I, you know, it's my, I probably spend the most time on LinkedIn right now. Ooh. And you can tell from your uh, screen time thing on your app. Uh, yeah. No, we need to talk about that as well. It's super interesting. <laughs> um, so much to talk about. Okay, let, well, let's move on from Web Summit because, um, to be to be fair, we didn't really see anything too interesting apart from the fact that it exists. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, should we go to Tesla? Yes. All right. So I think we both got a few clips on this. Um, mm. Now, Tes- Tesla, everyone knows Tesla. They've had a few issues in 2018, um, notably the CEO and former chairman, um, whose name is Elon Musk. 
Um, and due to the, oh, I don't know the organization that uh, sort of made him do this, but he had to step down as chairman for three years. <laughs> and uh, they had 45 days, I think, to do this. Um, and they appointed an Australian. Yeah. Um, so Her name is Robin Denham. Denham, Dan, Dan, Dan Denham. Oh, that, that is how you say it. Uh, spelt D E N H O L M. Um, now, just who is she? Here's a bit of a backgrounder. Denholm is currently the CFO of Australian telecom operator Telstra. She's going to be leaving that role as part of this once her six month notice period with the company is up and serve as chair as full time, uh, chair full time. It's, it's a full time job now. Uh, Denholm has also been an independent board member at Tesla since 2014. A Tesla spokesman says the company is still actively searching for two more independent board members. In a statement, Musa Denholm has extensive experience in the tech and auto industries and has made significant contributions while on the board to help Tesla become profitable. Yes, so she is the current CFO of Telstra, as, as the guy said. Uh, that was from a, a show called Squawk Box on CNBC. Squawk. Yeah. <laughs> ba basically, you know, some pundits talking about tech stuff. Um mergers and that sort of stuff uh yeah so i think this is um pretty good for australia i guess um do you, do you know much about her have you yeah so i uh, looked into it a little bit um she used to also be the coo of telstra um mm. before telstra she was with a couple of networking companies but more importantly she was the national finance manager for toyota so really good mix yeah. of silicon valley um telecoms and you know uh, car manufacturing which is all you mm. need now um, while you went down the smart sort of uh, YouTube uh, video production companies, I came across Fox Business News. Hey, before we get into the, the crazy and wacky world of that, do you have anything else? Uh, uh, no, no, I'll let you go first. I've got a few um, maybe follow up clips there, but uh, I'll let you go first. All right. I want to just warn our listeners, this is about to get a little crazy. Um, so it's one of those weird uh, talking heads where you have six of them uh, of really sort of, out, you know, um, very outgoing personalities all talking about the same thing. Uh, the first one that they're going to talk about is, will she actually have any power? Gang, what happens with the first time there's a conflict between the two? First of all, I think the conflict goes Musk's way. And this is uh, really? window dressing, as far as I can tell, to bring someone in from basically Musk's inner circle and say, oh, now you're going to be my de facto boss, I think is just uh, placating the SEC. So, yeah. So um, the more I listen to this uh, video, the more I realize that uh, they're actually pretty good friends. And she's been on the board since 2014. Um, here's a different angle to it. And it's just great looking at her smile there. You get the, the impression that's the last time she's going to be smiling, <laughs> dealing well, with crazy Elon. I mean, is she really going to tell him to stop smoking pot on oh, on the air? Is not. she is she going to go in there and say, Elon, you cursed out Jim Chanos, the, uh, the short seller. Stop it, please. <laughs> So that's, you know, uh, the second clip on uh, absolutely having no faith. Now, this is the one piece of news that I didn't know about. And did you know that his brother is also on the board? So check this out. But remember, she's on the board. She was picked by, by him exactly. on the board. Guess who else is on the board? The brother. Kimball, Kimball is bro. <laughs> the <laughs> brother. I mean, that's the point. This is really a buddy board. You, yeah. you know that? So, yeah, a buddy board. Um and it looks like it's just all a front, um, which has me really concerned about Tesla. Mm. Okay, a couple of things there. Mm. So what what are <laughs> they? I mean, apart. From, okay, so she's been on the board. I, I don't think there's the, there's no evidence that they're actual like friends, buddy friends. I don't think there's any evidence of that. Just I don't know. Did the board of directors? Hang yeah, um, I came across another article from CNBC, uh, and there was an analyst there from uh, Bard, uh, which is one of those companies. Um, they didn't earmark this at all. They, I mean, they could easily dream up uh, a list of 10 people from the outside of Tesla mm -hmm. who would have been a perfect chairperson who could sort of, you know, help them uh, steer themselves on the right road. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, but they didn't. Um, there was talk of Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook. There was talk of uh, Larry Ellison. 
Um, but they didn't go with any of those and they picked someone from the inside. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, like this is just total. Uh... Yeah, it was, a, it was a fun video to watch and a fun video to clip <laughs> really because they're all so wacky and crazy. But that's the other side of this. Because I, I think they're basing, um, you know, her lack of authority maybe maybe just on that headshot of her. Like, what, what else do they know about her? <laughs> no, I, actually, no, no, I agree. Um, I actually have a um, clip of her uh, interview interview with her from March earlier this year. Nice. Because have you, have you seen or have you heard her speak? No, I haven't. I, I don't think anyone's done this except for, this is the only podcast that does this, guys, by the way. Um, yeah, just to let you know. Yeah. Um, so this is Robin Denham. Talking with a studio called, I've got it here, Light Reading, whatever that is. Um, and this is on the NBN rollout back in March this year. And so we're really tr- using this as an opportunity to transform our network. So we have a program called Network 2020. And then we're also digitizing the company at the same time. And to me, it's the convergence of these uh, two programs with an orientation around the customer experience, which is a really important fundamental part of our strategy as we move forward. And then we'll be able to take advantage of things like 5G and IoT and all the other uh, acronyms that are out there at the (laughs) moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if that was up to your expectations, but... um, yeah, she does sound like a classic Aussie, although she lived abroad for, you know, I think almost 20 years in her career, mm. um, but she's retained her Aussiness. Um, I, I did actually um, take out a lot of the ums and ahs there just because she did that quite a bit. But um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I don't there, know. Were, there were a lot of buzzwords in that interview. A well, lot. That's, that's true. And and I think that's that's what a chair, chairperson should be like. Actually, like she reminds me a lot of uh, Eric Schmidt. In the way he used to talk about Google, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, but I, th- I think it is true that it is a bit of a ruse. So they're just, they're just waiting for the three years to to finish, and I'm sure, I'm sure Elon Musk is still the boss, right? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I just find the whole thing funny because, like, what, what are they basing this on? And the, the whole talk that yeah, she can't stand up to him, and you know, and, and that whole clip uh, of him smoking pot was. Like, not even a thing. Like, did they even yeah, watch? No. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I just, I, you know, I found that video and I found it really funny. Um, we should give her a chance. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, by, by shifting people around, giving them different responsibilities, hopefully that gives Elon a bit more time to rest and focus on some of the core engineering uh, aspects of his role. And I think that'd be really cool. Um, while, you know, let the chairperson, the, the other independent directors sort out the uh, the running a little bit of the company. Um, and you know what? I think I think all this is good, regardless of how this is viewed. I think this is just good for Elon. Mm-hmm. Um, just, just on the board of directors, because I, I actually, I'm on the investor relations uh, tesla.com site, <laughs> um, which is not HTTPS. Oh, my God. Um, James Murdoch is another one that recently got onto the board. Did you know about that? No. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know. Aussies are kind of taking wow. over. Yeah. Got our hands all over this thing. Yeah. Uh, there's Brad W. Bus. <laughs> um, Robin is a new one. This well, is an geez, episode of a... names now, isn't it? Yeah. Ira Aaron Price. Antonio J. Gracias. Why does Aaron Price sound so familiar? Ooh, let's read his bio. Ah, okay. oh, website not found. Oh, God. The hell? They're really... Yeah, you know what? They're, they're, they're building cars, people, not websites. Who's the head of content here? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, lots of fun and games with Tesla. Hmm. Um, what's the last thing we wanted to talk about? Singles Day. Ooh. Yes. So, um, Singles Day is sort of China's Black Friday. It happens on the 11th of the 11th, um, and it is easily you know, tens of times bigger than what Amazon can do on Black Friday. Um, it happens every year. So we decided to have a quick look into it in terms of, you know, how, how big it actually is. Um, I've got a clip here uh, just, just, just showing you how big it is, even though it's declined slightly year on year. We talk about lowest ever growth. We're still looking at 27% year on year growth for Singles Day 
um, in yuan terms. And, you know, that, of course, is slower than the 39 percent recorded last quarter. Uh, sorry, last year. But we've got to remember, this is the 10th anniversary of Singles Day. And I think there will come a time, this perhaps is it, where those 30, 40 percent year on year growth rates for Singles Day starts to slow. Of course, you had. Yeah, so so it it is it is starting to slow a little bit, but we're talking about like a forty percent year on year growth, and we're talking about thirty billion dollars in a day. T. That's right, people. Um, now Australia had um, a Black Friday just recently as well over the last <laughs> weekend. Yeah. Um, how would that stack up? Probably less than a billion. Oh, I, I, did, I didn't. I don't have those numbers with me, but. Um, talking about Australian uh, companies, um, they also had a big win uh, during Singles Day. Uh, there was a couple of good articles about Crumpler doing really well in China. Um, a couple uh. of milk companies. Um, so, so everyone around the world is, you know, tapping into the the, the, the market. Um, the other big winners um, are, are, are tech companies we also know. So, I've got a quick clip here by CNBC following up on that first clip. Apple was the top selling mobile brand. Um, on the singles day itself, Starbucks managed to uh, break its own record and achieve its highest ever sales on singles day as well. So, yeah, so Apple, the number Starbucks. one phone on singles day and Starbucks, oh, okay. yeah, selling coffee and mugs, I guess. Online? Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it shows the, the Aussies are on it, the Americans are on it. Um, and it, it just is amazing because there's there's so much happening in China and people are just spending so much money in all these different things from coffee to phones. So jump on it. Mm. Now, I know we talked about this uh, maybe a couple of years ago when we talked about uh, Singles Day. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the or- origin of it is like literally for singles buying stuff for themselves. Is that, would I be correct in saying that? That's right. It's sort of, sort of like, you know, the... Um... The, the opposite of Valentine's Day, uh, yeah. where people just buy things for themselves, uh, which I think is a great concept. So, Kelvin, we might leave it there. Um, we, we went through some random things today. Um, no no big events, uh, which we're famous for, I think, of, of late anyway. Um, but we will talk about, uh, well, we will both review our own new MacBook Airs because I'm getting one on Wednesday. That's right. Um, uh, I'm running it on now, and we're obviously running into a few issues here and there. If, if anything, this episode was a really good uh, test for 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 you know the new Mojave uh, operating system for Mac that I haven't seen before. So can't wait for you to get yours, and can't wait for us to do our review episode uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so this has been episode 113 of the Lazy Couch Podcast. If you want to listen to all the other 112 episodes, go to our website. That's thelazycouch.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you're listening on iTunes, don't forget to leave some feedback and rate us on those stars. Um, or just leave us a feedback in, in any of the apps you're listening to. My name is Calvin Lee, and this is Kelv out. Jeff out. Pika pika. <laughs> Yeah, no, got to figure this out. <laughs> I think it might sound sound weird because it crackles and then doesn't crackle. Maybe I don't know. I'm just trying to think ahead. I'm I'm hoping it, it could be a mix of USB C, Mojave, ZenCaster, Firefox upgrading a version. Yeah, but it happened at the same so time mark. In both recordings. So it has to be. It yeah. has to be. Some sort of memory. Zencaster. Memory leak. I'm right. Memory leak. <laughs> Stop saying memory leak. <laughs> because I'm looking at the Intel um, widget again. It's flat. Uh, the temperature is okay. The frequency is fine. The graphics card is fine. The power is fine. The utilization is fine.